Thank you so much for coming here. It's really an honor that people, after a really long, and intensive, and jam-packed experience of being at this conference, full of information, that you've decided to come in this somewhat of an awful room. And I'm an architectural designer, and I can say that this is kind of an awful room. <laughs> that you're willing to pack yourselves in here like sardines in order to come. And my intent is that I can deliver in some way. And the, um, the wonderful thing about talking about creativity is it's creativity, and it has this universal appeal. The difficulty about talking about creativity is you have to be creative in some sort of way. Otherwise, the, it just doesn't quite work. I had prepared a PowerPoint presentation earlier, and I recognized that it's such a linear mode, it just doesn't quite fit with creativity. But I do have one video that I want to show you later on that is awesome. I'm just going to put it like that right now, okay? So, my name is Austin Hill Shaw. I'm an architectural designer. I'm a teacher and a speaker and a writer on creativity and innovation. And I also do healing work. And I'm also a practicing Vajrayana Buddhist of 10 years. And this path of one creativity through architecture and two the work that I do studying creativity and the healing work have all sort of gone together. I graduated from architecture school in 2001. I took refuge in the Buddhist path in 2002. And then during a three-month meditation retreat in early 2004, I got insight into the nature of creativity, which I've been trying to unpack and continue to unpack to this day. But I'd like to share some of what I've learned and I'd also like to recommend a book that I finished, which was an eight-year project called The Shoreline of Wonder. And this is basically on the view of creativity. So anything that's missed here, this is available in the bookstore. And please buy it from the bookstore because you benefited maps in doing so. They get half the proceeds. So first question, how many of you feel creative in this room, okay? How is going to low end of the spectrum? Like the, the zeros to one, two, three. How about that level of creativity? What's the highest? 10, thank you. <laughs> 10 is the highest, maybe 11, okay? How about in the mid-range? Who feels that they are creative in sort of the mid-range, okay? Now, how, who sees themselves to be really creative, okay? So... The thing is, is that the, 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 the most important thing that I have to say to you is that basically creativity is not a gift of certain individuals and not others. It's a defining trait of what it means to be human. And in this crowd, I see a lot of creative people. And I think I can attribute that to your love of psychedelics and your love of information and understanding and experience in general. Other crowds that I talk to, when you get to the top end, very few hands go up. And that's true even among young people, too. People in schools, their hands don't go up either, okay? And there's lots of reasons for that. But my goal, my mission in life is to empower others as creators, young and old, whatever profession you're in. Creativity is basically the defining feature of what it means to be human. And the reason it feels so good to create is because when we are creating, everything is online. Everything that makes us human is online, okay? So the first thing I want to do is basically, if you can leave me a little bit of room right here. Thank you. First thing I want to do is basically I want to create what in Buddhism they call the Vajra spot. The Vajra spot is the place where heaven and earth are joined. And I want to put it right there, okay? And I need your help in doing that. I need you all to basically say, okay, here we are over. Here I am over here with my sort of ego identity separate from you all. Here I am with maybe all my hopes and fears about what may happen with this presentation. Here I am in this god-awful room being like, ugh. And take all these sort of 
many complaints and sense of separations and abandon them all in here when I step into this place of wholeness in the center. Are you all ready? Okay, so hold that intention for me. Are you ready? So now I'm in the Vajra spot. And the Vajra spot comes from the word. Vajra basically means lightning bolt. The Vajrayana lineage is the culmination of the Hinayana and Mahayana lineages in Tibetan Buddhism. And it's known as a non-dual lineage, which is basically about connecting heaven and earth. And we're going to try to unpack what that actually means, how that relates to creativity, cosmology, communion, and psychedelics in about 20 minutes. Okay? <laughs> all right. So first of all, what is creativity? What is creativity? Just take a moment in your mind to picture what this, um, this thing is. I mean, it's huge. Okay? So the first definition I want to offer of creativity is what I call the ground of creativity. And that is that whatever it is, that organizing force that has taken our universe from 14 years, billion years ago which, as a singularity and converted it to this somehow. And we've only been on the scene for about 150,000 years. And that's kind of miraculous. Okay? So the Buddhists would call that, they would call that causality, that there's things that are just sort of working and shaping themselves according to the laws of nature. All right? Now, the ground of creativity, as I define it, is basically made up of dynamism. Everybody is always moving. Interdependence. That everything is interrelated. Like the best way of thinking of that is gravity and space time. That we, all matter is constantly affecting other matter. It's incredible. And there's, anyways, could go on and on about that. And finally, there's mystery. We don't really, we understand that the universe supposedly started with the Big Bang, but what was beyond that? We have some ideas where this thing called life came from, but we don't really know on some levels. And then finally, we have this thing that we wrestle with as human beings, which is conscious self-awareness. That's really the thing that makes us human. That's really the thing that we wrestle with. It's both a tool and it can be a detriment. Okay? So that is the ground of creativity. Now, stepping outside here again, as human beings, we are wrestling with this thing called ego. And in the modern world, we're wrestling with a particularly difficult and challenging version of ego, which is basically that it's inflated. It's ramped up. Thanks to things like Facebook, where we picture, paste all these photos of ourselves doing awesome things. Thanks to advertisements that say, hey, do this. If you buy this, you'll be this cool. And all sorts of other things. We're basically wrestling with ourselves on that level. And creativity is a way by which we get out of that. So once we start to talk about human creativity, I have a very simple definition for it. Human creativity is one, connecting with the world. Two, affecting the world in a meaningful way. And the third aspect is kind of in the space in between. So let's explore those different places. Now remember, here's the Vajra spot, the place of wholeness, okay? I'm going to step over here for a second. This is connecting with the world. This is connecting with the world, okay? In creativity, this is the experience of insight. This is the experience of a light going up on top of your head. It's the experience of something coming to you. The way that I define this came from William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, actually looking at the section on mysticism. That experience of like, aha, uh -huh, no matter what it is, that quasi-religious experience is the experience of insight. Okay? It's about opening up. It's actually about dying. Something in the ego dies for a moment so that something new can come in. Okay? This is the experience of insight. This is the passive aspect of creativity. And there's language for all these things. In science, this is called divergent thinking, a type of thought that diverges from normal thought patterns. In art, you could call this artistic ex expression, or actually artistic inspiration. 
And at the level of religion, and specifically to Buddhism, they call this wisdom. Wisdom is an uncovering of your natural well awareness that is always already available. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Now let's go to the opposite over here. Over here, this is called manifestation. This is the world we're living in right now. Where we're mostly relating with our phenomenal ego, our sense of who we are. We have moments of opening, but basically we see ourselves as over here in the world out there. Now the benefit of this in terms of creativity, if we don't have the ability to do this, we're technically schizophrenic. So over here, in order to manifest anything, we need to be able to say, I'm over here, my resources are, resources are over there, this person knows that thing about that, and then I can ask them, and we start to get into the realm of interdependence. This over here is the realm of the arhat, a person who basically leaves their ego in order to attain nirvana. This is the archetype of the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva who is basically foregoing their enlightenment, they're not doing those experiences all the time for the benefit of all sentient beings. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the Vajrayana, back to the Vajra spot, this place in between. This is a word, a simple, what I call this is very simple on some levels. First of all, let me, let me go over here one sec just to give you one. Scientific word for this is convergent thinking. This is what coffee does. It focuses your attention on something. Caffeine, right? Next, at the level of art, this is craft. This is all the work you put into whatever it is you do so that you can do it well. And at the level of religion, this is the realm of compassion. This is doing things for the benefit of others. That's the proper spirit for creativity, really. Okay? Now, into the Vajra spot, this is the culmination of creativity. In this place, we're drawing upon both of these worlds, these very different worlds, okay? This is why I call my book The Shoreline of Wonder, because you're drawing upon the ineffable experience of the ocean on some level, shape-shifting, deep, incredibly vast, changing every day. And over here, the sense of knowing what you're doing, that sense of continuity that defines you as different from other people. Does that make sense? So in here, between the ineffable experiences of insight and the, def the things that we need to define to do the project, we find imagination. In the Sufi tradition, they talk about imagination being like the isthmus that connects the known and unknown worlds. We discover wonder between the sense of absolute truth over here and this flexibility that we need in order to actually get it into the world. Does that make sense? Okay. Next thing that we have is that we basically have a sense over here. These tend to be short experiences, brief moments, like micro instances, up to few minutes, maybe hours, sometimes days. But in order to bring things into the world, it takes time, as you know. You get the idea, but to realize it, this is the enduring portion. So in the middle here, we have patience. Patience. If you're impatient when you're trying to create, you run up against all sorts of obstacles. And the trick is, some of those obstacles are actually there to help you with your project. Does that make sense? Ego hates that. It hates that. OK? So next, between um, the the uh, the, the passive experience of something coming to us and the active portion of bringing it into the world, we discover flow, which Doug talked so beautifully about in his, in his talk about climbers. I was a climber too. My book opens up in Yosemite, way high on a mountain, because that's a place where people have a lot of flow. You're using your body and concentrating in an incredible way. In Taoism, they call this Wu Wei, actionless non-doing. You're not quite sure if you're spending energy or gaining energy. It's an amazing place to be, and you all know it. You've all been there, okay? And finally, and finally, between the individual and the collective, we have something that's incredibly important for the, for, in order to create, and that is love, okay? 
Love is basically this thing that we practice. We practice entering back into the world, seeing it as miraculous, and appreciating it for as it is. It doesn't mean we like the world all the time. I do not like this room. I don't like it. But I love that I have the opportunity to be with you all in here. That, that's the attitude of love. It doesn't mean repressing things and being like, I can't say that. I don't, if it was at the Gabor Mate talk, he said, don't, imp- don't suppress things. You may feel hatred. You may feel rage. Do it in the space of love. Frame it within the context of love. Okay? So this is creativity. And the language of this here, in science, it's called paradox. I mean, what is what happening is something is converging and diverging at the same time. It's a paradox. In, I'm going to go to the original religious portion of it. Here we have non-duality. Okay, non-duality is basically, or you could call it wisdom and compassion inseparable. They're happening at the same time. And there's a level of art, which is in the convergence of everything, of heaven and earth, passive and active, and there's a way of life full of imagination, flow, wonder, patience, all these elements, we find self-expression, artistic expression. You see? So this is creativity. All right. Got to go check in with my timepiece here. Okay, good. Now, we want to bring in cosmology to this, all this, okay? So again, here's the Vajra spot over here. The Vajra spot, everything's happening. This is one view of reality, which is the current prevailing view of reality, which all of us have adopted. Most of us, I should say. If you've gone to the educational system in the United States, you've been trained in this method. And that is basically that the world consists, and the universe has basically come into being by more and more complex orderings of inanimate things that led, led to life billions of year, years ago on our planet, and then finally to conscious self-awareness somewhere. So basically, consciousness within the scientific paradigm is a teeny tiny thing resting on a pyramid of basically inanimate stuff. All right? Scientific paradigm. Over here is the traditional paradigm. All right? The traditional paradigm is basically that actually the entire universe is conscious, and out of that is precipitated a teeny, weeny, tiny bit of matter. And if you look at space, I mean, it doesn't make sense to us here. We're full of a room. There's body odor. There's heat rising. We're in the phenomenal world. But if you look at our universe, it's mostly black, empty space. Beyond that, the physics don't actually describe totally what's going on there. Does that make sense? Like scientists can account for like 1% of that matter, and then the physics say like, well, there's actually about 99% more. We just can't see it right now. Okay? So that's also true. This is also a true paradigm. Okay? Now, in the Vajra space, both are honored. Both are honored. Okay? Now, let me step off here for again. We want to talk briefly about communion. And communion, as you know, in the Christian tradition, it's basically taking uh, the blood of the body of Christ, taking bread and wine, which is an incredibly radical idea. I love that as a Vajrayana Buddhist. I like the idea of taking in, like a perfect being into my body and saying, yes, I am Christ too. That is a really valuable way of looking at, at our life. There's also communion with nature where we go in and we settle into places and we allow nature, the more you settle in, you know, just you start getting these dialogues with nature. You know what that's like, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, so that's communion. But what we're here for, why we're here at this conference, is that particular amazing experience of psychedelic communion. That act of taking something into us that, one, is a chemical working within the scientific melu. Did I say that right? Melu. Did I do that? Melu. Thank you. It fell off when it came out of my mouth. (laughs) Okay. Here we are. So scientific. This is so 
I want to use the ayahuasca ceremony to talk about this. So ayahuasca, as you know, it has this thing called DMT from one plant. It has MOA inhibitors from another plant, and they're combined. Who came up with that? Incredible. Okay, so there you are. There's your brew. It's got a taste to it. As you know, you know, it's got a quality to it. You can hold it in your hand. And yet what it does is it unlocks this thing, you know, that's kind of indescribable. It's really, this is the ineffable right here. This sort of, whoa, something comes in, all right? And in the ayahuasca ceremony, there's people that are doing different things on that, okay? So first of all, back over to here. This is the experience of insight. Remember this spot? This is the light bulb going off in front of people's heads, above people's heads, right? How many of the participants are partaking in this experience? Most of them. Almost everybody in there is basically just having a continual stream of insights. And yet physically, you're incapacitated. I mean, if you've been in those positions where you have to go outside and you can't get through a door, you just, you can't figure it out. So this is a type of awareness that is lopsided. It's really powerful in a certain way. Okay? Over here, you have the minority. They might not even be in the room there. But these are the space holders. These are the support outside. These are the people who are standing by. These are the bodhisattvas. These are the ones that are willing to forego their ayahuasca experience so that other people can have their experience. Got it? So here, these are the space over minority within the psychedelic experience, the ayahuasca experience. And now we have a third entity which is in the room. In Buddhism, we would call this the Vajra Master. In the ayahuasca cosmology, this is the shaman. And I want to just, it's time for a video, okay? Hope this works. So first of all, I didn't want to get this wrong. I didn't want to screw up the metaphor. If you get a video going and, you, you know, nobody wants a metaphor for it. So basically, there's an ocean. And in Buddhism, the ocean represents the mind, okay? It's symbolic of the mind. It's got this depth. You know, Buddhism says there's a body, there's speech, which I'm using right now, and energy, and then there's mind. That's the absolute. The other thing that we have in this video are waves, and waves are the arising of phenomena from mind, okay? Next, we have a jet skier, and that represents the ayahuasca, okay? And finally, we have a surfer, and the surfer represents the shaman, mediating between these worlds, okay? So here we are, early in the ceremony, taking the ayahuasca, it's pulling the person in. You're aware, still aware of the taste in your mouth, and then here's the shaman moving along. Moving along, here comes the traditional cosmology. We're starting to see the amazing display of mind, of this thing that is always already available. And the finite ego gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You've all been in that situation. Whether you take ayahuasca or not, you know what that's like. And then... The role of the shaman is basically to smoke tobacco, to sing, to move their body in order so that they can stay right in this spot between being overwhelmed by the substances the, the participants are and continuing forward. <laughs> I mean, is that a or what? So anyways... He actually does get overrun at some point. You know, that's, I clicked it off. You know, I mean, look at that. It's like five stories high. It's insane. Okay. 
just to conclude, because I think I have, what's my time there, one minute? Zero minutes? Just to conclude, to bring this back, okay, because we're not always big wave surfing, are we, in our lives, okay? I kind of alluded to it earlier, how to live a creative life, all right? The daily practice, and I'm a religious fanatic, and when I say religion, I mean keep rebinding yourself to the world in which you live. You've heard that theme throughout. The people from John Hopkins, amazing. Keep doing it. It's not about dogma. It's about rebinding. Over here, the experience of insight is about our daily practices. Whatever we do, a few moments a day, I call it the daily dose of death, where you step outside the way, you've, you, know, the way you go about things habitually with your caffeinated self, with your Facebook self. You either meditate, you pray, you give thanks on some level. Over here, this is where we live the majority of our lives, okay? This is where we are working in the world in order to bring our gifts as creators, whatever that is for you. It might be scientific, it might be technological, it might be any of those things, okay? And finally, as we move through the world, this is the space that we're aiming for, to be in the Vajra space, where we're like the shaman, mediating between the ineffable experience of insight and the rock meets bone effort, the precipitation that we need in order to carry that out for the benefit of others. And trying to stand in here, remembering to use our imagination, miraculous, our ability to wonder, miraculous, our ability to be patient, which we don't always do, our ability to flow, and most, most importantly, which was the single greatest thing about Jesus Christ was it's more important to love than to be right. More important to love than to be holy. We are trying to love. The more you love, the more you will naturally be creative. I think I'm out of time. Thank you. One last thing. I had a mailing list going around. If people want to sign up for anything, you can go to austinhillshaw.com. Um, the other thing is, uh, yeah, there's evaluations too. I, evaluations and testimonials, feedback, those are really value to, valuable to me. Okay? So thank you. Thank you all for coming.